Uh, okay. So I should first thank the organizer for the very nice school, uh, nice weather, and giving me the opportunity to give the final uh, talk of the day. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, some universal results that we can obtain about the correlation functions, cosmological correlation functions at the, uh, at the BIOSK using a very general principle, it's basically the equivalence principle. And this is the, based on the work done with this gentleman. Uh, and uh, at the end, if I had time, I will talk about some applications of these ideas to improve the, uh, the perturbations here. Uh, okay, so most of it will be uh, blackboard talk. I will show some plots. Uh, so let me start. Let me start from equivalence principle. Uh, Okay, so first of all, in cosmology, we, uh, we use this density contrast, contrast to uh, characterize density perturbation. So we write rho, the density of dark matter, as rho bar, the background value times this delta, which is the density contrast. I guess you have seen it many times. Uh, and then we want to talk about the gravitational effects in the non-relativistic limit, uh, all of it, uh, so if we are non-relativistic, all of the gravitational effects are in the Newtonian potential, which satisfies uh, this simple Poisson equation. Uh, OK. So now we want to consider some uh, very long wavelength perturb matter perturbation. Uh, so there is something like this, uh, some delta long of x and t. Uh, there is, it's a linear perturbation, so it, I can write it as delta Q of T times cosine uh, Q dot X. Uh, and then I can use this uh, Poisson equation. This implies that uh, there exists a very long wavelength gravitational potential. Uh, now, what is the equivalence principle? The equivalence principle tells tells us that there is this line wavelength gravitational potential. Uh, now, suppose we have a very a small, a small object or a small laboratories uh, in here, and they are performing some experiments. The equivalence principle tells us that everything, falls in this gravitational potential with the same acceleration. Everything that is close to each other, uh, things that are close to, to each other compared to the wavelength fall, uh, fall with, uh, uh, with the same acceleration. So, for instance, if I want to, uh, if I want to uh, calculate the amount of motion by anything, I can actually use the, the, the amount of uh, displacement of dark matter particles, since everything falls the same. And for dark matter, we have these simple equations, which are linear level. For instance, we have this continuity equation that uh, tells me that in the linear regime, Delta dot is equal to minus divergence of V. So if I take this equation uh, and integrate it uh, to get a displacement, this, this equation tells me that delta X, the amount of motion in some, uh, some amount of time, is given by um, something like Q divided by QS squared, delta Q of T uh, times uh, sine q dot x. So this is the motion of a dark matter particle, and then every, every, everything s falls the same. Uh, th this fact tells me that if I have uh, some laboratories doing local experiments here, so suppose I have some, somebody doing some chemical uh, experiment at this point. Uh, 
So th this guys, uh, everybody in this laboratory is falling in the same direction. So these local experiments cannot tell me about the existence of this line wavelength mode. Uh, but uh, so wh wh what can we do? What, uh, some, uh, we, we can tell about the existence of this line wavelength perturbation if there are two distant laboratories. So if there is another one here, uh, and I, I stand far away and look at the motion of these two things, then I see that this, this, uh, this laboratory moves in one direction and this one moves in the other direction because this delta x, the motion that I calculate is a function of, uh, is a function of x. So uh, there will be some correlation between the relative motion of these far away objects, uh, the relative motion of the far away object and the line wavelength potential. So that, that, is, the, uh, that is the kind of correlation, the kind of effect that this line wavelength mode can induce. Uh, but, so, uh, okay, the problem is that in cosmology we cannot see that. So in cosmology, we only see one snapshot of the universe. For instance, we see galaxies at, at some time, at some point in their life. Uh, and what we can do is to calculate or to look at the distribution of the galaxies. Uh, I denote the, the contrast of that galaxy by delta G. But it doesn't have to be galaxies. It can be anything, like laboratories. Uh, so what we see in cosmology is the distribution function. That is something that we can talk about. So let, let's assume that we, we look at the two-point distribution of the galaxies in the presence of this line mode. Let us ask uh, what would be the effect of uh, this line mode on this distribution. So I look at the uh, two-point correlation function uh, at the separation x in the presence of the line mode. Uh, this I can write as xig at x. This is the unperturbed one, the correlation function in the absence of the line mode. And then there will be the first correction given by this, uh, where this is delta x of one of them. I have to take the difference between the x of the two to get the relative displacement. The relative displacement will be something like two delta q uh, times sine q dot x divided by two times q dot grad divided by q s squared x i g of x. And then there will be corrections to this formula. So there are two types of corrections. And uh, it's very, uh, these two parts, distinguish, distinguishing these two parts is very important. So the first part are the higher order displacement terms that can appear in here. Um, so remember, this is just, uh, now this delta x is not that delta x. Maybe I should put some r here for relative. So this is the relative displacement. Uh, so this term is just the relative displacement uh, the Taylor expansion to first order in relative ex displacement, of course, there are higher order terms. And uh, it's trivial to keep them. Uh, at the moment, I don't need them, but later on, I may. Uh, so these are under control. The other ones are the, the so-called so dyna, or maybe not so. Uh, the, the, uh, I, we can call it dynamical effects. Or the, basically, they, there are terms uh, basically, the long, so this long mode is not, uh, is, uh, the, the density contrast of the long mode is, is a locally observable quantity. So in principle, the correlation functions can depend uh, in an unspecified or non-universal way to the density contrast of the long mode. So there are these types of corrections. Uh, that are not universal and not under control. So the, there are these corrections and then this. Thing. And uh, I should emphasize that this, uh, this displacement that I calculated here is something uh, of order one over Q times delta Q. So if I 
keep my density contrast constant and send the wavelengths to infinity, then this term diverges. It becomes very large. Or let me call it delta A. So this, this displacement becomes very large. And similarly here. Uh, while these terms, uh, I just said, by definition, I'm taking delta L constant. So uh, at least naively, this, this displacement terms seem to be the dominant contribution or the dominant effect of the line mode on the distribution of the short modes. Uh, okay, so I have dominant, I have subdominant, uh, and okay, let's see what we can do with this formula. Uh, so first of all, let's let's uh, let's consider the case in which uh, this distribution of the galaxies that we considered here is a scale invariant. Uh, so this is case number one. Then we have uh, a scale invariance, which means that I assume a gradient of xig at some scale r is approximately 1 over r times xig. Uh, OK. So if this is the case, then let, let us also consider two, two special uh, situations. Uh, first, let us focus on the case when QR uh, is much less than 1. So it is a really long wavelength. Uh, then in this case, this delta x relative, this quantity, um, is this. Um, so this delta x relative will be of order. So basically, we have this sign here. Uh, if q dot r, where r is the magnitude of it, then q dot q r is much less than one. This sign we can expand it. Uh, so there is uh, this thing is one over r, one over q. There is a q here which cancels. So the whole thing, this delta x, the relative displacement will be something of order r times the line wavelength uh, density contrast. So if we take something like this and plug it here, and let me call this term, uh, which we are interested in uh, by a star. So the star term in this limit will go to something like uh, delta L R times gradient of xig. But by the assumption that we, are, we, are, uh, we have a scale invariance, grad xig is 1 over R. Therefore, this is our delta L long xig, but this term is of order of the, of order of these neglected terms. So this is of order uh, okay, so too bad. This is not, doesn't give us anything. Uh, the, the other situation, so this was the very long wavelength limit. Uh, the other situation is when q R uh, is of order one, or maybe large. By the way, this is not that. This this observation is not shouldn't be that surprising. This is exactly the the statement that if you have a small laboratory and do measurements here, nothing should tell us about the presence of the line wavelength mode. So if if I'm taking this R very small, it means I am doing very small experiments. Uh, much smaller than the wavelengths of the long mode, therefore I shouldn't see anything. Uh, then we are considering the, other, the opposite situation. When these two, the distance between the two points are, is large, comparable or much larger than the wavelength. Uh, in this case, the, the relative displacement is large. Uh, so it is actually of that order. Uh, but it's still, but still, if you have a scale invariance, uh, still this term is hopeless because, uh, because we get delta L times 1 over Q grad xig. Uh, but this is, with the assumption of a scale invariance, this is delta L xig times 1 over QR. But this is a smaller than delta L xig, which is the negative which is, again, the size of the neglected. 
Uh, so in both cases, if you have a scale invariant uh, distribution function, the presence of this, uh, the presence of the, basically this, this dominant term uh, in the effect of the long mode on the short mode is, uh, uh, is not really dominant. It doesn't give, it, it gives comparable contribution to the two-point distribution function. So this is an observation that, uh, that is uh, basically summarized as, uh, by this conclusion that the, uh, so this dom dominant contribution that we, ca we can calculate just based on symmetries, they usually go under the name of the consistency conditions because uh, they really follow from symmetries and therefore any any theory should agree with this result, or they should apply to any situation. That's why any uh, that's why they are called consistency conditions or relations. Uh, thanks. Uh, okay, so so this the summary. The summary here is the. Uh, uh, this consistency relations uh, are are trivial uh, in the case of larger scalar structure. In a sense that this term doesn't give any dominant effect. Uh, okay, so this was the case of a scale invariant distribution function. So the point of the talk is to, to say that if we, have a scale, if we don't have a scale invariance, then these conclusions are not correct. And it, there, are, there, I'll get, there will be a dominant effect. Uh, it is calculable and it is, it is observable. It has interesting consequences. Uh, and in our universe, we do have violations of a scale invariance. Uh, because of the because of the presence of the BAOS at uh, at R uh, equals LBAO. So as as David explained, uh, the the matter distribution function looks something like this, and also for galaxies and other stuff, it will, it is it does also have this uh, this BAOP. A little bit exaggerated, perhaps. Uh, and it has some bits, which I call it sigma. Sigma is much less than LBAO. And uh, the physical intuition for this peak is that there, if there, there is some initial perturbation, it, uh, the, the baryons, there, there will be a wave in the baryon photon plasma. It moves up to some scales until decoupling. Then they decouple and the, the baryons and dark matter equilibrate. Uh, after equilibration of baryons and dark matter, we have something like this. At that moment, the, the, uh, the, the perturbations are still very linear. So what I really do is that I take this as my initial condition, and then, uh, and then we have evolution. So I, ha I start from initial condition, which looks like this. And so what does it mean? It means that uh, if I look at the a uh, gradient of this two-point correlation function, uh, this, this is of order one of, at, at, at this BAO scale, so at R of order LBAO. This is of order one over sigma times Xig, uh, which, is, which is much larger than one over LBAO times Xig. Now let's revisit these two, two cases. So in case number one, um, in case number one, we have Q times uh, Q L B A O is much less than one. Uh, then here, I had a gradient of Xig, this R is LBAO, this gradient is one over sigma, so I get a star goes to delta L Xig 
uh, LBAO divided by sigma. And this is much larger than delta L times XH. Ah, OK, good. So this is much larger than the neglected test. Uh, in the second case, um, so the second case is when Q is uh, larger than LBAO inverse, but it is much less than sigma inverse, the width of the peak. Uh, then, uh, okay, then I have this formula, and this, again, this gradient is one of the sigma. So here, a star goes to uh, delta L xig divided by um, Q times sigma. This one is also much bigger than delta L times xig uh, because I am assuming Q is much longer. La Q is uh, smaller than the one over sigma. I'm considering modes uh, whose wavelength is larger than the widths of the BAO peak, but is uh, smaller than the BAO scale. And because of this condition, there exist such modes. There are modes with wavelengths in between in here. And this is the regime of number two. Uh, OK. Uh, uh, all right. So we have, we have this dominant effect. Uh, so what can we do with it? Now, now that we have this dominant contribution to the four-point function, we can, uh, we can correlate. So now we, we realize that this, this uh, star term, that this displacement that we wrote here, it is the dominant part of dominant the effect of the line. But now we can correlate it with the long wavelength mode and calculate the three-point function and claim victory. Uh, so I calculate the correlation function. Oh, let me write it here. Uh, so I, we have delta of Q, delta G of X over 2, delta G of minus X over 2. Uh, so this becomes P linear Q times sine Q dot X over 2. Q dot gradient over Q S squared X I G R. So basically, we calculate a universal term in the three-point function uh, uh, in the three-point function between one matter perturbation and two perturbations of anything, galaxies, it can be matter or anything, uh, laboratories. Uh, uh, so this is, the this is the dominant term in this three-point function. And it has this universal form. Now, in fact, uh, now I'm going to show a plot of this in some examples. So this thing can be checked in perturbation theory and can be seen that, in fact, it, this, uh, th this describes the dominant contribution to the three-point function. But before that, let me mention uh, some important points. So, um, so it happens that in the case of in our universe, this, this bump is very prominent. And uh, this bump, I can basically write this correlation function. I can decompose it as, ex, as some Weigel part plus non-Weigel part. And it happens that, in fact, this Xi Weigel at the position of the, at the BAO scale over Xi is of order unit. So, this is much larger than the background scheme variance. Thank you. Uh, uh, so this is our order unit. Uh, but in fact, it didn't have to be our order unit. This part didn't have to be very large to get this contribution. Uh, we could have a tiny little bump in the correlation function, but as long as it, it broke a scale invariance as long as its width was much smaller than the, the scale at which it, it appeared, there would be this universal contribution to the three-point function. Uh, so 
so yes, now he, this one is giving the actual, the largest part of the correlation function, but in general, one could divide the correlation function into a, a scaling part and the Weigel part, and we would still have this part as some contribution, some universal contribution to a three-point function, which otherwise is almost, which can be arbitrary. So we cannot say anything general about it. Okay, so let me consider the situation in which this delta G, I replace it with actual matter, this, uh, matter uh, um, perturbations, and, uh, and let us, uh, then we can use the usual uh, formalism of a uh, perturbation theory to calculate this correlation function and see uh, how does that, uh, the result of the ca perturbative calculation uh, compares with this, uh, with this uh, prediction. Uh, Okay. Yes, yeah, so the upper panel of this plot shows, uh, shows the comparison of this formula with the result of perturbation theory, with the full result of the perturbation theory. The, the solid line is this formula, the, the dash, dot dashed line is the result of the linear perturbation theory. Uh, and uh, well, you can see there is a kind of two, 20 percent, or there is about 20 percent, uh, the, the difference is of order 20 percent, I think 10 to 20 percent. Now, uh, now, in fact, the, this point that I made here is illustrated in the lower panel. The lower panel is the same formula, uh, but calculated using, by, uh, uh, by, by subtracting, uh, I'm almost done. Is <laughs> uh, illustrated by subtracting the uh, scale invariancy, and you see that the match is much better. Uh, so, yes. Yeah, so now, now we can also we can also consider we can also take the Fourier transform of this result and this Weigel term that we have, this bomb that we have, it corresponds to having some oscillations in the power spectrum. Uh, and uh, so we can, we, can, we can again take, so this leads to some power spectrum that again we can, uh, this, we can uh, decompose into Weigel and non-Weigel part. And this term basically predicts some universal component, uh, universal uh, oscillating component into the in the in the uh, in the part in the uh, squeeze limit correlation function in the momentum space, uh, which as you, we, so in the upper panel again shows the the result compared to the full result of the perturbation theory, but the lower panel uh, shows the result when we we talk we subtract the uh, scale invariant background and only talk about the, the oscillating point. And you see that, that there, is a, there is a very good agreement in the squeeze limit between the two. So let me just say, uh, what, what does this really mean, this, uh, this correlation that we have calculated? So th what this correlation means is that, uh, remember this uh, BAO scale meant that if I have over density here, there is a, uh, there is larger probability to have dense, over density at a radius of order, uh, at a radius of order LBAO. So uh, schematically, it's like something like this. So I, I, uh, I, I have, uh, if there is matter here, then there, there will be some, sh some shell surrounding that, some imaginary shell surround, surrounding that. Now, when, when we have some long wavelengths, matter perturbation, that distorts and deforms this shell that we have around the, uh, at BIO scale. And this correlation function is really showing us how the shape of this, uh, this ring that we have is correlated with the line wavelength mode. So that is really what we are calculating here. And we are calculating that using the, using the equivalence principle 
because the, we are assuming or we are in the regime that the wavelength of the mode that we are considering is much longer than the widths of the widths of the uh, this shell, uh, and therefore everything in the shell just falls like a, like a small laboratory in the field of the line wavelength mode. Uh, okay, so probably now it's a good time to pause and uh, take some <laughs> questions. Uh, if, if there is interest, I can continue after questions for 10 minutes to tell you about the application of this to improve the results of perturbation theory. Thank you.